Hello, I'm happy to be talking with you today in concert with my Gould Farm collaborators, Lizanne Finston and Steph McMahon and Gould Farm guests about Gould Farm. Uh, this is a talk that we gave in July 2023 at the Kripalu Center for uh, the, a conference on nutrition and mental health. So this will be a journey together in two parts. Part one, what does it mean to live recovery at Gould Farm? And part two, how in the world can we demonstrate and define recovery in ways that honors the individuals involved? Because after all, people's experiences in the programs vary, and yet best practices in outcomes research necessarily involve aggregating data across people. But I'd like to start with gratitude for the delicious, healthy lunch that we shared at the Kripalu conference, literally breaking bread together, companion, from the Christian ritual of communion, from the Jewish practice of breaking and passing around pieces of challah, from the Islamic injunction that food is sacred because it sustains life and should never be wasted, from the hymn used in the Underground Railroad, let us break bread together. It's about much more than food. It's about sharing our lives. And that's a segue to the first topic, living in recovery. So living recovery at Gould Farm, what does this mean exactly? And how is living recovery operationalized in practice? What does breaking bread together have to do with it? Well, basically I'd say everything to explain. From its founding 110 years ago until now, Gould Farm is about recovery in relationship. Importantly, relationship with the natural environment and with other people. So broadly speaking, food production for the community, farming, and the stewardship of the land is the platform that undergrounds the Gould Farm program. Now, in 1913, there were plenty of people with serious mental illnesses, but few treatment options. Beyond the few small, privately run institutions, asylums, as they were called in the true sense of the word back in the day, like Austin Riggs, Gould Farm, and the Institute of Living in Hartford, Connecticut, there were large state mental hospitals. Some of you locals may remember Northampton State Hospital. I worked in one such mental hospital, state hospital, in the late 60s and early 70s and experienced firsthand the lack of agency and dignity, the total lack of treatment, the lack of hope there. But Agnes and Will Gould's vision in 1913 was different. Bring people together experiencing emotional and psychiatric vulnerabilities to join them as guests, as they're still called, working on the farm and sharing the joys and the challenges of daily life in a kind, healthy community. Helping people find their place of belonging and bringing back to them the desire of living and working to people who had lost it. So how do these principles work in practice today? And how do they work in the context of being a fully licensed Department of Mental Health Treatment Program? These are the core components of the Gould Farm program. First, living in community. At any given time, there are about 35 guests and a roughly equal number of staff, as well as staff partners and their families, residents, dogs, and cats, all of whom live on the Gould Farm campus. They share work, meals, ideas, and importantly, recreation. Music is big in the community, as are yoga, art, hiking, soccer, pond hockey, and other seasonal activities. There are also community rituals, bringing down a Christmas tree from the forest and building a sukkah for the holiday of Sukkot. At Thanksgiving dinner, there are up to 100 or more people, guests, staff, and all their families, and many former guests coming back from a for a homecoming from across the years. There is also counseling focused on individualized recovery goals. The program includes therapy on a weekly basis or more often as needed by master's level clinicians. Counseling is fully inclusive of guest goals and guest input, whatever those goals are to deal with voices, to maintain sobriety, to return to work or to school, 
or to deal with the grief and the losses that serious mental illness brings and to move forward in their recovery. There are also groups, including off-campus involvement in AA and NA. Medication is used as needed with collaborative shared decision-making about balancing the benefits of medication with the challenges of its side effects and with physical health. As you know, physical wellness is a huge challenge for people with serious mental illness, particularly those taking certain antipsychotic medications. Connection to the natural environment is a unique and critical element of the program. So Gould Farm is a 700 acre working farm and guests are intimately connected to the land from their very first day on. Stewardship of the land and the animal life is integral to human wellness for all Gould farmers. Indeed, I would say for all people. I've noticed that there's a kind of parallel process or synergy between how a forest system or a garden as a whole thrives when all of its elements are valued, cared for, and sustain each other, and how this synergy works in the human community when all of its elements are valued, cared for, and sustain each other. The whole is more than the sum of its parts, both in the natural and the human ecosystems. Meaningful work, last but definitely not least, meaningful work. People don't want their life to be defined by their symptoms or to revolve around treatments of various kinds 24 seven. We all want and need to be productive, to learn new skills, to be truly needed by others. So the work program is key at Gould Farm and it's at the top here for a reason. So how do you run a program that accomplishes the very real work of a farm with meaningful collaboration of guests and staff that nonetheless accommodates the diverse needs and capabilities of people in ongoing recovery? Here we need to dig deeper into the work program. At Gould Farm, there are six work teams, each comprised of guests and staff and led by an expert in that area. The teams work for three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon with breaks and lunch hour. So the garden team works, starts while there is still snow on the ground with seedlings in the greenhouse, then planting, weeding, watering, and tending to the vegetable gardens through to harvesting. Their practices are fully organic and the food goes right to the table or to putting up for the winter. In some years, there's a small CSA and or participation in the local farmer's market. The bakery team makes all kinds of really good breads and pastries, professional quality products. The farm team takes care of the animals, currently cows for dairy and beef cows, following best practices in animal husbandry. That past, in the past, there have been pigs and chickens. The campus crew tends to the forest and the grounds, the cleaning of communal indoor spaces, it chops wood, it does maple syruping and other activities. And the kitchen team puts all of this together, turning out three healthy meals a day for the community and organizing the volunteer dishwashing in which everyone takes turns. The Roadside Cafe is a breakfast and lunch venue that serves the general public. And this serves as an opportunity for guests who are ready to learn all the related skills involved in food service and ready to interact with the public. It's currently closed while this building that you see is being replaced. More on that later. So I'd like to talk some more about the work, which is key, key to Gold Farm program. For any task in any setting, there's the end goal and then there's how you get to that goal. So there's this dialectic between the product and the process, which is particularly core to a therapeutic work program. Let's take cheese making, for example. The community needs cheese for its own food and also for selling. So this is real work, meaningful work, not make work. And at the same time, there's also constant attention to the process, the how the cheese is made. Choices about the process of cheese making are constantly being discussed and modified so that guests are not just included, but integrally important to this task. For example, a shorter, smaller, more friendly breed of dairy cows was recently introduced 
to make it easier to accommodate guests with physical and mobility challenges. One guest recently remarked that working with cows is a mindfulness practice itself because of how you need to be totally present when working closely with them and beside them. Also, the team leaders made significant modifications to the entire cheese making process, which used to demand staffing in the early morning, through lunch, and late, late into the day. So that schedule is not compatible with the guest work schedule. Now, cheese making is in sync with the daily work schedules, with lunch and so on, so that guests do not miss out on participating in the entire process. So the way in which they made cheese, the schedule was modified. Finally, in the last four years, dedicated effort and energy has been put into pasture soil health and rotational grazing. Rotational grazing is the practice of moving animals through pastures to improve soil, plant, and animal health. So resting grazed paddocks allows forage plants to recover and to deepen their root systems. Guests learn about all of this. They learn about the, the, the why behind what they're doing. And these pra practices transfer nicely, we think, to the recovery process, the dialectic, the metaphor of rest and effort in the recovery process, as well as rest and effort with the natural resources. So as you can see, a great deal of thought goes into the work, the needs of the community and the clinical needs of the guests and how they relate to each other. One's expectations and plans sometimes need adjusting. For example, once I visited with my own expectations and I went blueberry picking with a group of guests and staff. And one guest was having a particularly difficult day. He was really quiet. He was hearing voices. He was struggling just to be present in the moment. And he picked about three blueberries in the, in the entire morning. And I thought to myself, oh, is this going to be hard for him? He sees how many other blueberries people are picking. He was quiet. We all got out of the truck coming back from the blueberry patch. And I overheard him say to the team leader, thank you for including me in this. I'm really happy I got to pick blueberries this morning. And so for him, three blueberries was an accomplishment. It was there. He was with other people. He was doing work. Some years ago, uh, we tried a CSA model. I'll get to these pictures in a minute. We tried a community supported agriculture model where there were people who bought into a CSA. And that seemed like a good idea at the time, but as it turned out, it created quite a bit of stress in making sure that there was enough vegetables picked for each basket on a certain schedule when the CSA members would pick them up. And it got to be the point where staff members were working overtime to try to fill these baskets and it wasn't really a guest focused program. And so that was dropped and now we share the uh, produce at farm stands and um, hopefully at the roadside store. What you see here is the inside of the old roadside store. It was quite small. There was no place to, to get away when you needed for a breather from the work. The workspaces were small. You know, food service industry is stressful in general, but this space made it less than ideal. Uh, not only to serve the huge need for the community, but also for the guest mental health. And so this is currently being replaced. I'll tell you some more about that later. Well, here it is. This is the artist rendering of the new roadside cafe, which is much more spacious, more space to move around, better work areas, instruction areas, kind of uh, areas where people can chill out when they need a little break from the public and is also uh, more inclusive of the natural environment. You can see the light, the large windows. It'll be a place for community gathering, for people to literally break bread together and to destigmatize mental illness within the community and visitors from everywhere around the US who might come through Monterey. So hopefully that gives you a snapshot of what living recovery means in the Gould Farm model. So. Let's take a moment now and just pause to consider all of the skills that are involved for guests in living in a community on a working farm. Key across all the teams, this work is a medium for building micro level skills and macro level skills. Things that you might take for granted, like having a good night's sleep. How do you do that? 
being able to get up in the morning and get out and be at a work at a certain time, confidence, work habits, initiative, rebuilding social skills. The work program is inextricably linked with the other elements of the program, especially the clinical services. And work team staff are in close communication with the clinical staff and with the guests about each guest's needs and goals. So on the spot, they can tailor their work with the guests to help them meet their goals, both in the nitty gritty day-to-day -day work and in their planning for how to structure the work. The work team is always adapting to the circumstances of each guest on each given day. So here's a harder question that we all grapple with in the field. What does it mean to recover? And how do we study that? Especially keeping in mind that our guests are in recovery from serious mental illness. We don't love diagnoses at Gould Farm, but we use them for several reasons. And here, this is one of them, just to kind of give you a snapshot of what some of the things that guests are struggling with. Fully 50% with some schizophrenia spectrum disorder, also bipolar disorder that has been recovered, recurrent and difficult to treat. So 75% of guests have, or more, because if you take severe depression into account, have illnesses that have interfered with their ability to sustain their goals in living and working, to stay in school, to keep jobs. Um, typically, they have multiple hospitalizations before they come to Gould Farm. So that's the context. And now we'll take a sharp turn into topic number two. How do we define and demonstrate recovery? Or maybe it's subtitled, sounds nice, but how the bleep do you study it? I'd like to spend the rest of the time sharing our efforts to answer that question, what we learned about outcomes, and also a bit about what we learned about doing sustainable outcomes research in real world settings. Uh, this paper is based on the results of research that we started in 1999 it was published in 2019 in Psychological Services, and the research is ongoing. Participation in the study was voluntary with fully informed consent. Uh, nearly all guests agreed to participate. And here's what we did. We interviewed people about two weeks after they had come to Gould Farm and settled in. We then interviewed them again, just prior to their discharge from Gould Farm. The interviews were conducted by an experienced mental health worker who was not a regular staff member. So to kind of cut down on demand characteristics. The timing between these interviews varied depending on the length of stay. So from a couple of months to several years. In this study, the average length of stay was about six months and the median was 10 months. 90% of guests stayed less than two years. Then we attempted to locate people after they had left the farm for follow-up interviews by phone. And we tried that at six months, 18 months, and 36 months after discharge, where possible. We started this in the 10th year of the study. And this was difficult. We'll be talking more about that later and how we dealt with it. During both the pre-treatment and the post-treatment interviews, guests completed several validated measures in common use in the field. First, the basis 24 is a widely used 24 item self-report scale out of McLean Hospital, I believe. Uh, it's a scale of psychiatric symptoms across different domains of symptoms and functioning uh, and lower scores indicate less severe symptoms. So the lower, the fewer symptoms, so the less severe the symptoms. Global Assessment of Functioning or GAF is a scale from zero to 100 about how people are functioning in work and life. Uh, GAF scores in the middle range between 40 and 60 indicate serious to moderate symptoms that interfere with life and work. GAF scores were assigned at intake and at discharge by our psychiatrist. They weren't used in the follow-up protocol because there was no psychiatrist out there to do it. Now, during the study period, the DSM, this comes out of the DSM, the DSM got rid of GAF scores, but since our psychiatrist were, was used to doing them, thought there was some value to them, and since we wanted to maintain continuity in the data set, we kept 
the GAS scores in the protocol. The audit was used to rate alcohol use, substance dependence, and consequences. This is a 10-point scale scored from zero to four. It is also used for other drug use, although in our sample, there was too little other drug use to include in the analyses. The audit was designed and validated specifically for use with people, uh, for people with serious mental illness. And finally, a self-reported quality of life scale. This is an eight item measure on which people rate their own satisfaction with various elements of their life, independent living, daily structure, physical health, mental health, family relationships, social skills, community support, and spirituality. This goes on a scale from zero to 10, with 10 being the highest satisfaction. And there are quality of life scales in wide use in the study of serious mental illness with the idea that recovery is more than just about not having any symptoms. It's also about building a life that's satisfying to you on these various dimensions. So this was <clears throat> in addition, at intake only, we asked people about various demographic characteristics, education, uh, treatment history, educational history, all of these um, things that now our electronic health record system automatically collects. At discharge only, we included questions about their plans for post-treatment living, working, schooling. We asked about treatment satisfaction, both quantitative and qualitative questions and we got their consent for follow-up calls and some numbers where they could be contacted. Also at the follow-up only, we asked questions about their current living situation, their safety, their security, education, employment, physical health, and other such items. So this was the data set. We got 259 participants who had both admission and discharge data. And then we had another 345 participants with admission data only. So these were people who we were not able to get discharge data for. I'll be talking about this later, but we essentially used it as a comparison sample. <clears throat> Regarding follow-up data, we managed to have calls with 55 people at six months, 30 people at 18 months, and 16 people at 36 months. Although these results were generally very positive, even compared to benchmarks in the field, it's a small data set and too small, we think, to make too much of. So we're considering those results preliminary. For data nerds out there, these data were analyzed with SPSS with these tests, which were appropriate uh, as appropriate to the various research questions. So what did we find. First question, did people's symptoms decrease during the time of their stay at Gould Farm? The answer is yes. There were statistically significant, less severe symptoms from intake to discharge. Moreover, this is true across diagnoses. It didn't matter which of these diagnoses guests had, there were still significant decreases in symptoms within those groups. How about the GAF, the psychiatrist's assessment of their overall mental health functioning at intake compared to discharge? Uh, first note here, these GAF scores are low. As I said before, scores in the 40 to 50 range is serious mental health disability. Scores in the 50 to 60 is moderate disability. However, they were significantly higher at departure and again, within every diagnosis. So there was not a moderating effect of diagnoses. The psychiatrist rated assessment of functioning scores were higher at discharge. But as I said before, recovery and living is more than just about managing your symptoms. It's about living fully. So here we looked at the quality of life scales. These, this is a busy slide, so let me explain. Each set of columns represents one of these dimensions of the QOL scale. So independent living, daily structure, and so on through to spirituality. The bars we want to pay attention to are the first two, the light blue and the red. 
And this represents the guest rating of their, in this case, independent life skills at intake, and then the red at discharge. For now, we're not making too much of these bars, which are the six month, 18 month and 36 month follow-up. So again, there were st statistically significant changes, increases, improvements in self-rated quality of life from intake to discharge for every single one of these dimensions. We then asked some other questions that were of particular interest to our stakeholders. So our stakeholders are guests, parents, staff, and board members. And I think one of the uh, uh, elements of doing sustainable outcomes research is to be open to fielding such questions and asking them of your data set the things that people are most interested in. So we asked whether gender mattered or age mattered. It did not. These gains were similar for people of all ages and genders. Similarly, length of stay in the Gould Farm program didn't matter. There were still significantly better uh, symptoms, quality of life, and so on, GAF scores, regardless of how long they stayed, which is interesting. And a particular interest to the board was, did it matter how much they pay? So Gould Farm, in accordance with its charter, tries to serve people of all different income levels. And so we had uh, a third party, uh, someone in the, in the office, give us a rating of one, two, or three, how much that family was paying. And we used that to test whether how much they paid moderated treatment outcomes. And they did not either. Regarding treatment satisfaction, we asked guests four questions rated on a one to four scale about how much they were satisfied with their treatment. This was phrased in four different ways, and we found that there were very high intercorrelations between these four questions. So we created a composite treatment satisfaction score. And you can see here that the average treatment satisfaction was pretty high, 3.63 on a scale of one to four. Satisfaction was not associated with diagnosis, with fee scale, with any of the de demographics of guests that we measured. It was associated with lower basis 24 scores, so better symptoms profile, and with higher quality of life mental health satisfaction score. So it seems that guests are... Um, thinking to themselves, how much did I change? How much do I think I got better? And the more they feel like they changed, the higher the satisfaction. However, it may also be that people who are more satisfied with the program invest in it more kind of all along the way, thus facilitating their own progress. In future research, we'll try to be fair at this out. We'll, we'll be monitoring both clinical progress all along and satisfaction all along, that is during the course of treatment, to see how they relate to each other over time to try to answer this question about kind of what's driving what. And that brings us to a discussion of some of the limitations of this research. Oh, before I move there, satisfaction was weakly correlated with length of stay, such that the longer the stay, the more satisfied. This is a pretty weak correlation. It was statistically significant given the large data set. So what are some limitations, realities of community-based research? Uh, when I wrote this, I thought about that Joni Mitchell song, The Circle Game, and the lyric that goes, though your dreams have lost some grandeur coming true, or maybe they just lose some grandeur when you acknowledge that what's ideal from a research design point of view is not easy or often possible in the real world. And by that, I mean a non-university-based, non-research uh, research setting. So first, there was no randomized control group. We didn't field intake calls and say, okay, you folks are gonna be on the waiting list or you're gonna be in a placebo control group and you other group of people are gonna be treated with Gould Farm. That's a randomized control group. Um, that is the gold standard for drawing causal conclusions because it rules out alternative explanations for change. So people at Gould Farm got better, maybe it was just the passage of time, 
or maybe a new medication was developed during that time period and everybody, not just those people who were treated at Gould Farm got better. So we can't technically say that Gould Farm was the cause. We can only say that of the people in our group, uh, they had better uh, measures when they left than when they came in. And then there's the question of study attrition or, or miss, missing data. The fact that we weren't able to get discharge data for everyone who was treating. We've learned that discharge data missing is very common in residential treatment settings, but it means that conclusions about outcomes should be limited to the sample that had both intake and discharge data. So a big question is, how representative of the entire population of people treated during this time at Gould Farm was that sample of people who had both intake and discharge data? Were they different in some way for the people that we missed for discharge interviews on their way out? We compared the comparison sample, the ones with just the intake data, to the people with complete data sets on every dimension on which we had data, all the demographic characteristics, diagnosis, previous treatment history, education, substance use, fee scale, and we didn't find those two groups to differ on any of those variables. So we don't think that they're substantively different groups of people. And so that rules out that possible concern. Another possible concern, though, is that the data that we're missing, we're missing not at random. That is, they were missing from a particular subset of guests Maybe those who left abruptly because they were not improving or because they were dissatisfied or because they needed a higher level of care in a more secure setting. We kept data on the reasons why discharge interviews were missed. And none of those things that I just mentioned were the typical reason why. It wasn't because people were in crisis. It wasn't because um, they had been using substances. It wasn't because they really hated the program. The most uh, common reason by far was that we couldn't get the off-campus interviewer here at the time that the client was, the guest was leaving. Families came early. Um, the interview was busy. The interview was out of town. So it was really around scheduling uh, that we missed that data. Uh, this is going to be improved in ways going forward that I'll talk about shortly. Another really interesting and, and more um, and a provocative question is around measurement. And measurement of recovery, defining recovery, is trickier, trickier than it might seem. So even very good questions on valid self-report measures that everybody's using who's doing this kind of research, those questions can mean different things to people. Those very same questions can mean different things to people at different points in your recovery. So if we ask, for example, on the quality of life scale, are you satisfied with your social life? One person who kind of maybe early in the recovery says, yes, finally, I have a friend. I have one friend. It's a good friend. I'm very satisfied. So, you know, seven, eight, nine. But as time goes on, that person might no longer be totally or very satisfied with one friend, but wishes, say, they were dating. So that very same question, are you satisfied with your social life? They might say five because their definition, their very definition of what's a satisfying social life changes. Same with employment and so on. As our expectations and dreams change, the numbers on the scale might mean different things. So there's a need to use multiple measures and to think creatively, including, I would say, about more ideographic or individualized markers of change. So I put this picture of the field of broccoli here to remind me of the following story. Um, we did some focus groups as we're thinking about the next iteration of our research, did some focus groups with guests and with families, asking them, what does recovery mean to you? How would you define recovery? What kinds of things should we be asking that would indicate recovery? And one dad talked about driving onto campus with his son who had been severely depressed and withdrawn and not interested in much. Um, and they drove onto campus, the son was in the car and the son said, look at that broccoli field. I planted that broccoli, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> and the father said to me, that was an index of how much he had improved, how much he had changed. 
he was excited about something. He had participated in something. He was taking pride in something. He was doing work, real work. So that's uh, another thing that we hope to do is to find ways to use our new electronic health record system to create more individualized markers of change. As I've been alluded to, there were some very cumbersome data collection mechanics at the time. We had no electronic health records systems. Those were not even in existence or just coming into existence. So all of this was sitting with a person in the room, paper and pencil, entering data by hand, um, analyzing it uh, uh, with volunteers. And now uh, we have an electronic health record system that can collect much of this data all along. It can be synced with the clinical record. It can be synced with work team leaders reports. So we'll be able to have a much more efficient way of collecting data while people are here. Also, given the internet and all kinds of related questionnaire uh, platforms, we won't have to try to call people five times and interview them over the phone. By guest requests, we can send the questions to them once we've screened them. Uh, that is the guest for their interest and participation and the safety in their participation. We can send them to a website and they could fill out these follow-up questionnaires at their convenience, you know, in the evening, in the early morning, on a work break. And so uh, this will help immeasurably. And finally, back to another really substantive question to be decided, or I would say to be discovered, what are the mechanisms of change? I described to you the Gould Farm program, which is multifaceted. It would be really interesting to know, and we hope to study, how is it that people who change in a positive way at Gould Farm do? You know, is it is it medication? Is it counseling? Is it the work? What elements of this program working together are key to change? <clears throat> so we are embarking on outcomes research 2.0, I call it, with uh, updated technology, which should account, uh, which should cut way down on missing data and ease at um, collecting data. And we're also updating our measures in collaborative discussions with guests and families to problem solve around some of these measurement and logistic challenges, uh, making better use of our qualitative data. The qualitative data are so rich. And I think the best illustration of that is the uh, Gould Farm video that was recently done with two uh, former guests who visited the Gould Farm and talked about their experience, what it means to live in recovery, and uh, what they think was operative about their recovery at Gould Farm. Thank you very much for listening.